Welcome to Turning the Tide. This is Candace Salima coming at you from the heart of the Rocky Mountains. And today I am very excited because we are going to be speaking with Amy Hanlon, who is a representative in New Jersey. And she has written a book called, an ebook called Crony Capitalists in Our Backyard Who They Are, What They Do, and How to Fight Back. And I absolutely loved it. It's a quick read and is packed with information. Now, Representative Hanlon is the Deputy Minority Leader of the New Jersey General Assembly and an Associate Professor of Marketing at Monmouth University. She is a past member of the New Jersey Commission on Higher Education and a former former senior fellow at Monmouth University Center for the Study of Public Issues. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hanlon is a graduate of Harvard University, holds an MBA from Columbia University, and a PhD in marketing from New York University Stern School of Business. Prior to being elected to the legislature, she served on the governing body of Monmouth County and as a deputy mayor of Middletown Midship or Township. Sorry about that. Where she lives with husband David, son Daniel, and daughter Rebecca. Um, Amy, let me ask. Do you want me to call you Amy, Representative Hanlon, or Doctor Hanlon? <laughs> Amy is just fine. Thank you, Candace. <laughs> well, welcome to Turning the Tide. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Okay, now this is a very interesting subject that uh, we're going to talk about today. It is something that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it is the reason I started a radio show. Um, it, it, uh, the fight for America is in, in full battle now, and we are fighting so much. And I believe the Democrats have taken crony capitalism, called it capitalism, and are using it to try to destroy what has made this nation great. Do I have that correct, Amy, or, or have I misunderstood? No, you unfortunately have it exactly right. Um, the, uh, the, the main reason why it's come to the fore very recently is, of course, because of Solyndra and, and some of those other high-profile scandals in Washington. But the reason I wrote this ebook is because people need to recognize that while those high-profile scandals are significant to every citizen, the lower-profile scandals are not lower impact. They really corrode grassroots democracy. Um, they distort local markets, and they make a mockery of, 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 of honest public service. And the other important note is that it's not as though Republicans have completely clean hands um, no, no. On, the lo- on the local level. I mean, you know, as I detail in the book, um, there's enough – crony capitalism to go around, uh, enough enough blame for it to go around. And I hope that people will take a look at the book and specifically the, the suggestions that I make for how they themselves can make a difference and put a stop to some of this stuff. Okay, Amy, before we get into the meat of this, because I have, how many pages do I have? I have two or three pages of notes and questions. Just because I think, that just in the 30 pages of this ebook that you have, you have packed in so much information that is so useful. I really want every single American across the nation who is engaged in this battle for America to understand. And, and you know what, Amy? I don't think it fully clicked in my head till I read your book. But to understand that the nursery for what's going on in Washington, D.C. is in our local governments. This is where they are born, and this is where they grow. And then we elect them to federal office and wonder what in the world went wrong. Yeah, and that's so that's so correct. And and I think what you just pulled out was the central message of the book that if we allow this crony capitalism to go on unfettered in our state and local governments, um, and in our school boards, and in our authorities, and in every other entity in our backyards, then we're asking for it because these are the people who are the federal leaders of the future. They are the congressmen, the senators, the presidents. So, you know, we, in a sense, we, we deserve what we get. You know, if we sit back, say nothing, and let them get away with this stuff when they're our local representatives, then, you know, they, they grow up in the business, if you will, believing that this is business as usual and also that no one cares. And but you we know do. and I know that, yeah, we, that people do care. Yes, we absolutely do care. Now, so we get this right off the bat so that people understand and, 
And this is what I think has been the biggest problem, as I mentioned, is that crony capitalism and capitalism have been mushed together, and people don't understand the difference between the two. So would you be willing, Amy, to explain, define crony capitalism and then define capitalism and explain briefly why one is good and one is bad? Well, we'll start with capitalism. Capitalism is, is, is free markets and the pursuit of excellence in delivering value to, to uh, all citizens and to every entity. Um, you know, whether you're doing business with government or with other businesses or with individual consumers, if you are part of the capitalist system, then you pursue uh, knowledge as to their wants and needs and you try to satisfy their wants and needs with a high level of integrity. If you are a crony capitalist, then what matters to you is connections, not quality, uh, because it, it doesn't matter whether you, you sell junk or, or good merchandise. It doesn't matter whether you offer the best prices or the worst prices. You're always going to get contracts from your buddies in, in government. And if you uh, want me to go into it at this point, Candace, what I do is I divide the crony capitalists into four categories. Would you like me to go ahead and explain those? No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay, we'll hold off on that. But the, yeah, those are the bo those are the basic difference. Those are the basic differences. Well, and and they're not only basic, they're huge. They are night and day difference between the two. One is what made this nation great. The other is the prostitution of of capitalism right in in right. a corrupt fashion exactly. now right at the beginning of your book you wrote something that i just it was it was powerful and i wish that everyone in america could get it that accountability is key to integrity mm -hmm. and and uh, interestingly washington dc dc was stunned when america rose up and said listen you, you thought we weren't paying attention and, and we weren't for quite a while actually but um you thought we weren't paying attention, but we are now, mm -hmm. and we're holding mm -hmm. you accountable. And they were stunned. They were absolutely stunned that anyone would dare to have the temerity to say, mm -hmm. you know, we put you there, we'll take you out. Right, right, right. Well, I think one of the one of the for, one of the unfortunate realities that you just alluded to was that too many of us were asleep or close to asleep for too long, and we got a very, very rude awakening. And, you know, the only good thing to come out of our current crisis is that it did, in fact, wake up people throughout this country who are making a difference now. That That is no question. And we have seen that. And you do refer to it in the book that that the American citizenry in in uh, pooling their their powers as American citizens together managed to affect some change in Washington, D.C., but not nearly enough. And that's why I wanted to interview you today. Because today we're going to talk about where it starts and how to stop it. Mm -hmm. So why don't uh, you, you have some examples in here, and I certainly don't want to give all the examples because we want people to buy the book and read it. Right. But there was one that was very interesting to me. It was the – now, you are a representative in New Jersey, and New Jersey is in the news all the time right now because of your governor, Chris Christie. And, and – uh, He's a popular of the tea, a popular favorite of the Tea Party in some ways, and in other ways not so much. And so I'm going to actually, once we get done discussing your book, ask you a couple of questions because you do serve in that that uh, state legislature there. So anyway, um, you talked about a 60 million dollar garbage incinerator. Now you use that as an example of crony capitalism. Why don't you explain to the listeners? We'll use this example for you to lay out precisely how crony capitalism comes about using that. Well, uh, I was brand new to politics at that time, and uh, to give you an idea of how long ago it was, it was pre-internet days. Um, so we only had the traditional media, and there was a proposal by some of the other, uh, they're called freeholders that I served with, to construct a $60 million garbage incinerator. And what mystified me was the level of emotion associated with this proposal. You know, I can understand when people get emotional about war and peace, about religion, you know, there are certain <laughs> other things that really make a difference in people's lives and their it core to, <laughs> to citizenship. But garbage? You know, I, that, that made no sense to me. And what I didn't realize until much later was that what they were mo emotional about was that a lot of people stood to make a lot of money. Now, you know, I want to be clear about this. There, ultimately, there was no corruption associated with that plan because of the fact that ultimately the other freeholders agreed to put it on the ballot and the voters voted it down. 
So it never came to be. But it started me off on this crusade, which I have been pursuing some 20-odd years you know, since. Well, yes, and, and you mentioned in the book, you said, I'm, I'm going to read this paragraph because I, I think this is exactly what's going on, not only at the state levels, but at the federal level. You said, with both an MBA and a doctorate in marketing, I thought I knew the difference between business and government. One was a profit-making enterprise, that would be business in case anybody's confused, <laughs> <laughs> while the other was the institutional guardian of citizen rights. But I soon learned that government could become one big ATM machine for those who were smart, slick, and unscrupulous enough to exploit it. There was nothing wrong with serving your constituents if you were naive enough to think that they mattered. But the way to get ahead was to amass power, and power meant the ability to control jobs and contracts. Now, we see this on the local level, uh, just hand over fist all the time. But just in the national news, they just talked about on the federal level how the senators and the congressmen are allowed to use insider trading right, right. in order to make themselves richer, which that's why this caught my attention. And then, you know, we go into this might where we want to go into the, the classifications. So um, tell me, uh, I, this is very, very clear, but tell me, uh, expound on this one big ATM machine concept. Well, that uh, if you get to know the players and and become a big campaign donor or just a flatterer or a sycophant, you can um, get endless numbers of contracts, make all kinds of deals, without offering the public anything of any value. So, you know, that's what I meant, just the ability to go back to the, the well, or in this case the ATM machine, and just make more and more and more money without giving anything of quality and value in return. Yeah, and, and that's what's going on. I mean, we look at the federal level with a $15 trillion deficit that we have and realize that we've got to get it under control, and yet nobody wants to turn loose of their pet projects. That same thing is going on in the state level and even at the city levels. I mean, here in my own home city, we are fighting a huge battle with with things that are getting put on the ballot that I don't even know how they got that far. The, the, the city and, and state governments shouldn't be paying for these kinds of things, and yet that is what's going on. And and so we're, what we're talking about is is people who do the the under the table deals, mm -hmm. and and who the bottom line is to put more money in their pocket, more power uh, at their table, so that they can continue to get rich and exploit what we the citizens of America are supposed to be protecting. We we elect our representatives, our congressmen, and our senators to go and do the business of the city, the state, or the federal government. But it is the job of the U.S. citizen to do constant job reviews on these people, to pay attention to what they're doing. And, and so, Amy, let's get into what the categories are because um, they're good. Let's define them. And then let us uh, go with a couple more examples because I have to be honest, you talked about – just a second, a Mims Hackett, mm -hmm. who had been convicted of assault, battery, and kidnapping. How'd that guy get elected? Beats me. You'd have to ask his constituents. I don't live in that district. <laughs> I read that, and I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go to the categories. Well, first category is purveyors of junk. And uh, this is, goes back again to what I mentioned before. This is uh, situations where you have a business or a professional, an individual, like a lawyer or an engineer, who knows that it is not necessary to provide quality, that the only thing that matters is, is whose, whose pocket um, he has his hand in. And the example that I give there is um, out in Los Angeles, the community college, uh, in Los Angeles Community College District officials are elected and um, they're politicians who who uh, troll for campaign donations and when they had a project to renovate the various campuses of the Los Angeles Community College District they gave the, the job to a longtime campaign contributor and what they ended up with was uh, buildings with heating and cooling units installed upside down the uh, plumbing didn't work the floors were cracked the stairs were crooked 
and in a, in a new animal science center, the pig's trough was too high for his snout. So even the pig got cheated. Um, okay, well, I, I have to wonder, where were the inspectors? Beats me. I, I can't speak about that. All I can speak about, you know, how it happened. All I know is it happened. Yeah, um, and, and it's ridiculous. I, it, when I read that, Amy, when you detailed exactly what you just said, I, I was just stunned that there wasn't a a a, a, a figurative lynching yeah. politically. Yeah, yeah, it is astonishing, isn't it? And I'll give you um, another example. Well, I guess I, maybe I'll go on to the next category because it fits a little bit better here. This is an example that actually isn't in the book because they're endless. So that I, I couldn't fit them all in. <laughs> Sweetheart deal makers. These are people who make deals in back rooms that they are never exposed or certainly never vetted or scrutinized by the public. Um, in, out in, uh, again, California, San Bernardino has an airport authority, and the airport authority uh, was doing a redevelopment project. And so they, they um, gave out a deal uh, which was so, um, so rich that it actually sparked a grand jury investigation. But setting that aside, um, the interesting part was that the fellow who got the deal, the insider who got the deal, was um, a convicted felon who had been banned from working in the aviation industry. You are kidding. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not. I and mean, this is not a joke. Oh my goodness! At, he got a twenty. He got he he, 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 he got a twenty-five year deal with a guarantee of no less than five hundred thousand dollars a year. Isn't I'm, that something? I'm almost speechless, Amy. I <laughs> no, and as I said, I mean these are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, I, I I finished the research for the book and continued to 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 you know keep an eye on these things, and and almost every day I find a new example. Oh my gosh! It, yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, we see it here in Utah. I, I, as I was reading, I'm like, "Yep, that was this deal. Yep, <laughs> that, was that, deal. Yep, that was that deal." <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, it's here. It's here in our hometowns. So we have purveyors of junk and sweetheart deals. What right, can- and then then we have the earmark seekers. People think that earmarks are just a federal problem, but they should think again because in reality, there are earmarks at every level of government, these, these uh, illicit set-asides. And what I talk about is uh, how much money, to give people a sense of how much money is involved. Um, there was, there were, have been a number of state legislators who have gone to jail or been indicted because they've steered um, state grants to crony capitalists, to their, their campaign donors, their friends, their business associates, their relatives, what have you. Um, as an example of an indictment, the um, recent uh, um, majority leader of the New York State Senate um, was also a thoroughbred racing enthusiast, and he steered a, uh, a big state grant to his partner in his horse breeding business. Um, there was all kinds of, of uh, dirty stuff going on. He, he, on paper, there was a transaction where he was sold a worthless horse so that money would change hands, and you know it gets very complicated. It's very sordid. But, um, you know, give you an example, again, of the kinds of, of, of the magnitude of these things. In New York City, the individual um, council members um, get, get to divvy up um, millions and millions of dollars. Um, in, in, it's up to $8 million a piece, uh, depending on how you look at it, um, to just spread around. Uh, Los Angeles County supervisors get about $3 million to just spread around. And it's not just in the behemoth cities. In uh, Louisville, Kentucky, the members of the city council get between 100000 and 175000 that they can spread around. And you know, people need to realize that th- there is essentially no vetting of any kind. There's essentially no public scrutiny of, of any of this stuff. So they're just given money and say and told do whatever you want with it yes that it's up to you to decide what is what is and what isn't a worthy project and um you know that uh, you've been entrusted with this responsibility by the voters who of course have no idea this is going on and you know, they're not going to complain they're not going to say well you know we don't want to do this because this is great i mean what better way to reward your friends so you know this too goes on all over the country. It has been outlawed in some states, and New Jersey got so bad that we passed a law against it. But it goes on in a whole lot of other states. Um, it's pork. It's plain old pork. And whenever you talk about the problems with earmarks, people automatically think, oh, Washington. 
Of course, there have been abuse of earmarks in Washington, but they sh can't lose sight of the fact that it's not just Washington. And, you know, again, that's what my, my e-book is about. Yes, it is. And you actually talk about uh, um, State Senator and Newark Mayor Sharp James. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, uh, why, don't we, why don't you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, he was, um, it, as you said, a state senator as well as uh, the mayor of one of the, the nation's poorest cities. And he engineered uh, backroom land deals um, so that his girlfriend, who was a real estate broker, um, could make huge money um, in selling um, uh, public land. I believe she was a real estate broker, but uh, it, the the whole idea was to um, to to um, steer her uh, these under the table deals where she could buy um, land that belonged to the taxpayers at fire sale prices. Um, for that and for other things, he eventually went to jail. Um, served some time in jail. Uh, he's out now, um, and it remains to be seen, you know, what he'll do. Um, Does he still have his Rolls Royce? Uh, as far as I know, the Rolls Royce is gone. Um, but Good. But then I haven't <laughs> asked him directly. <laughs> yes. I, and I don't know what happened to the yacht, and I don't know what happened to all his other things. Okay. Now, is that all of our categories? Do we have one more? We have one more, and that's lobbyists for bigger government. Um, oh, these are yes. these are people who are hired at one level of government to use their influence to sell their influence um, at other levels of government. And uh, this happens very very often, where um, county, cities, towns, public colleges will, for example, hire a former congressman to uh, who sells his influence in Washington. Um, and they'll pay six-figure fees to that individual or others like him. I mean, this happens, again, on many other levels, um, in order to get more federal funds or more state funds, whatever the situation is. And the irony that I point out about this is that your tax dollars are being used to plead for more tax dollars to flow to your local government so that your local government can get bigger and hire more people and give out more contracts to more crony capitalists. So it's a perfect circle for everyone it's, but the taxpayers. Right, exactly. They're, we're the ones that are getting hosed left and right. Now, why don't you explain real quickly why that's a bad idea? Why which is a bad idea? Lobbying, lobbying. the bigger government? Yeah. Well, lobbying in the private sector is, you know, a perfectly respectable activity, uh, despite the fact that there are those like Jack Abramoff who, who have abused it. Um, it is a way for, um, for companies and individuals and organizations to have a voice in the development of policy, and, and I respect that. It's a very different matter when you have a, a, a congressman or a senator um, being lobbied by a former colleague um, or a state assembly person being lobbied by a former colleague um, because the reason there is that th these people at every level of government are elected, I myself am elected, to represent the interests of my constituents. Why do my constituents have to hire a lobbyist to, to, have, to, to make sure that I hear them? If I'm doing my job, I hear them. You know, members of Congress, members of the Senate have huge staffs. They have staffs in Washington. They have staffs in their home district. Why can't local governments, local officials, just, you know, talk to these people? Why do they need to hire others to intercede? That makes no sense to me. I, I just see that as an enormous waste of money. Well, not only that, it puts a middleman in place that you can't guarantee your message is purely being delivered and you know, I myself am very 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 <laughs> my poor elected officials are just all too familiar with me <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm like the text queen and so I text <laughs> them and say okay what's going on <laughs> you well, know good for you yeah well you know we're we're kind of lucky here in Utah um most of our elected officials uh, want to talk to their constituents and mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the lobbyists are hired by businesses and they're hired by organizations to go up to the uh, state level and in some cases I, I'm okay with the lobbyists and in other cases I'm not okay with the lobbyists but uh, yeah I, I understand exactly what you're saying and you're right when when uh, you you talk about in the section second section of your book about American history and how mm -hmm. crony capitalism is not new to this generation of America. 
No, not at all. I mean, there, there was crony capitalism going on uh, the, during the Revolutionary War period. There, there's always been crony capitalism. There's just so much money out there associated with government. And, um, you know, it, it's again, it's not a new problem, and it was recognized uh, by Thomas Jefferson, and it has always been with us. The, di- the big difference is that there's more money now than ever before in the hands of state and local officials. That is yeah. a, a huge change. And, you know, it is routine for little towns to give out million-dollar contracts. Um, you know, it is routine for public colleges to hire lobbyists at, you know, six-figure uh, salaries um, or more. Um, you know, this, these are not unusual examples. Um, they are everywhere, going on all the time. They're going on as we speak. And as people become more and more and more focused on what's going on in, in Washington, and, you know, that's a wonderful thing, and I encourage it, but I just urge them never to lose sight of what's going on in their own backyards. Well, and specifically, you said that some of the lowest profile officials are among government's most voracious, often uh, profligate shoppers. Right, right, because they that's buy. that's what talking about. Right, they buy so many things. They have the authority to give out so many contracts um, that you know, unless they are uh, they are scrutinized carefully, um, or unless you know you can count on them to have rid- a rigid sense of right and wrong, um, you know you're asking for trouble. I mean, that's the simple reality. That's human nature. It really is. And as an example, you talked about a gentleman by the name of Ray O'Grady. Yeah, he was someone that uh, I knew for many years in politics, and he was. Um, the local equivalent of Jack Abramoff, where you know he knew everybody, he loved to put people together, he loved to give parties, and what none of us knew was that on the side he was getting kickbacks. Um, and this went on for years until he was actually caught, and he was caught uh, taking taking cash from uh, undercover FBI agents, um, and you know he went to jail as well. Um, well, what was really rich, you wrote in there what he said to the F- undercover FBI agent as he was taking the payoff. That was the richest ever. Uh, yeah, he, his comment was, oh, I can smell a cop a mile away. Apparently not. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, and, and what's interesting about the Ray O'Grady story is he started out local. He yeah. started out um, just being involved. And and I, you know, when you described him, I thought, oh, hey, here in my area, that's so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Now, they haven't gone on to the levels that Ray O'Grady did, so don't anyone call me. But um, it, it, it is something where he started out involved and and just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more crooked. Right. And, and, you know, with his comment, I'm from Brooklyn, we know how to eliminate um what not obstacles, whatever word he used. Yeah, troublemakers or whatever. Trouble, yeah, 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 something along those lines. It it shows that he had the tendency to begin with anyway. Right. But but the the point about his story and he, the reason I brought him up is that we have to be ever vigilant of ourselves. We've got to set a standard for ourselves that cannot be broken. We've got to say, okay, this is where I don't go because that's dishonest. This is what I won't do because that is dishonest. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to go here. My job is, as you said, Amy, to represent your constituents. And you should be available to them. And they should be able to contact you and speak to you about concerns and issues or bring up issues that you that they believe need addressed. And, and that's what you are elected for. Right. And they shouldn't have to hire a lobbyist to do it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we have... Only a couple of um, of uh, representatives, congressmen here in Utah, who are a little tough to get to. Well, one is is a phantom. Many people think he doesn't really exist. That would be uh, Matheson, but <laughs> Congressman Matheson. But uh, it, it it is something. You know, you quoted uh, President James Monroe in 1822. He was warning about federal appropriations that were liable to abuse and productive of evil. Mm-hmm. And and you mentioned congressional earmarks specifically, special allocations made without vetting or scrutiny date back at least 100 years, peaking in 2005 at a cost of over $20 billion. I, I thought we peaked that last year. Am I wrong? Uh, I, or the year before, 2009? Um, it probably depends on how you calculate it. 
Um, well, that's true. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, could, what are we talking about? You know, a billion here, a billion there. You know, it's all outrageous. <laughs> It is. When 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 you talk about a billion like it's nothing more than a dollar, you know you know we've Yeah, been you're in trouble. Way yeah. Too long. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about there was something else I wanted to cover first before we went to how to fix it. Well, um okay, when we come back on the other side, you went through a little bit of a history of state and local governments and, and the booming and when they boomed and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I would like to talk about that on the other side of the break, and then let's talk about how to fight. Okay? okay. Very good. All right. We'll take a quick break. with uh, We're speaking with Representative Amy Hanlon out of New Jersey, and we are talking about her book, Crony Capitalism. Let me get back to it. Crony Capitalists in Our Backyards, Who They Are, What They Do, and How to Fight Back. We will be right back on Turning the Tide. Thank you. 